Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for, uh, for braving the cold weather. Uh, and thank you for accommodating these rescheduled events from yesterday. Uh, my name is Mohamed Malouch. I'm the board chairman of the Tunisian American Young Professionals. And along with our partners at the Young Professionals in Foreign Policy uh, and the George Washington University, uh, welcome. We're grateful for this opportunity to speak about uh, the path forward for Tunisia. And we're, we're grateful to have uh, such a great panel to, to, to talk uh, about all of this. Um, Tunisia has been um, the subject of attention and visibility in the past uh, few weeks, uh, for good reasons, actually. Um, in, uh, you know, coming from the region of the world where, unfortunately, there's not enough positive developments, uh, this is actually one development that, um, you know, should be celebrated. Um, the, uh, the adoption of this constitution, which was uh, labeled by a number of experts, a number of specialists, as one of the most progressive uh, in the Arab world. The appointment of a new technocratic government that has been sending uh, messages, both uh, internally and externally, that are positive. Uh, and also the appointment of an independent uh, electoral commission that is tasked with uh, putting together or organizing the elections, presidential, legislative, and local elections before the end of the year. And so all of these aspects have uh, really brought some hope uh, to Tunisians, uh, a good dose of uh, optimism, uh, a much needed relief. Uh, yet, uh, with all of these positive developments, um, and despite all of the international support that Tunisia has gotten, you know, for reaching essentially the end of the, the roads constitutionally, it very much feels like we're at the beginning of the roads, uh, the beginning of a much difficult, more difficult road, uh, because there are a number of uh, challenges uh, ahead of us, political, uh, social, security, economic, um, challenges that uh, we have to deal with and you know the the, the Prime Minister yesterday uh, made a, a TV interview where he reviewed some of these challenges um, and um, you know the the picture is really what we're going to talk about today in fact all of these challenges and uh, as a matter of fact how how do we think about short-term uh, and medium-term measures uh, that are feasible and that can maintain that momentum that Tunisia has. And so in order to do that, I, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to turn to our first speaker and introduce him briefly, not that he needs an introduction. Um, Mustafa Kamel Nebli uh, is the former central bank governor of Tunisia uh, from 2011, right after the revolution, up to July 2012. Um, he uh, spent a, a number of years here in Washington uh, in various leadership positions uh, at the World Bank. Uh, in fact, I, you know, there's a number of people at the World Bank uh, who, who make up his fan club. I, I walk with him at the World Bank and every once in a while people stop him and uh, you know, uh, um, ask him for autographs. <laughs> um, he served also as the Minister of uh, um, planning uh, and the regional development uh, in the 90s, uh, as well as the Minister of Economic Development in the government of Tunisia. Uh, and prior to that, he taught uh, economics at the University of Tunis. He holds a master's and PhD degree in economics from UCLA. So, Simustra, welcome. Um, what is your uh, assessment of the political and economic situation in Tunisia, and what are some of the short-term and medium-term measures uh, that can be taken uh, to maintain this momentum, and does the government have sort of the latitude and the leverage to take these measures? Uh, first, uh, thanks, Mohammed, for this uh, kind introduction, and thanks for this uh, opportunity to be here and uh, with uh, this uh, friendly panel. <laughs> and uh, and thank you all for being here to uh, to uh, follow and participate in this discussion, which I hope would be uh, quite uh, 
interesting. Uh, I don't know how much time do you... 10, 10, 10, 10 15 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, um, I think if we, wanna, if we want to look forward and see wh where we are going from here, essentially what's the path forward, I think it's very important to understand where, where we are now and where we come from. And I think this is important to understand how, how we go from here. And there is no doubt that today, uh, over the last few weeks, if you like, the last two months, uh, there has been uh, some sense of hope, uh, a positive uh, kind of energy which has been kind of uh, going on both domestically as well as we feel it uh, from around the world. Uh, you know, uh, the Tunisian uh, Tunisians have been able to agree on a on a constitution, uh, which uh, which has uh, you know its uh, positives and has its limitations, but overall it's uh, it's a consensus constitution. It has lots of advances in it. It has lots of uh, new things in it. And I think most Tunisians find themselves within that constitution, despite you know what uh, anybody would have to say about this or that or that fact. There is no doubt that uh, the political climate has cooled down a little bit, significantly maybe, uh, from the period since uh, the early 2013, or let's say from February 2013, since the first assassination, and uh, and since December 2012, since the first uh, assassination, actually the February the second, and then the July assassination, and so on. So the political climate was very, very. Uh, very unsettling and uh, the uh, tensions were very high and uh, we, there was a risk that things would really get out of hand and I think uh, we are lucky that we are able through the national dialogue, through the efforts of all parties to kind of withdraw back and then, you know, uh, have reason uh, prevail and, and, and come to some positive, uh, you know, outcome. Uh, part of it was, uh, you know, establishing and agreeing on a new government, which is uh, not partisan, uh, which will lead the country to through, uh, to the new elections. I mean, all of these things, you know, clearly there is a positive energy and there is positive outlook, which has been now. Uh, the question is, um, how we came to that point? actually. What were the issues that were outstanding, if you like, that got us to where we were in the crisis situation? Because I don't think that, and the, my point is that really the deep reason, the deep factors which were really behind the situation that as it developed in 2013, uh, these factors are still playing. They have not gone. They have not gone away. So we have been able to pull back from the brink. We have been able to build some hope to build. But I think what my point, the main point I would make is that the factors that are under and, and, and driving these processes are still with us. And if we don't, if we are not careful enough, they will come back and they will, they will have to be dealt with in the future. So what are, the, what are these factors? And, uh, and this is new, maybe some of you heard me say, oh, it, it's, it's, and uh, I mean, I'm not bringing new things. There are three main, three main uh, issues, three main uh, problems which, which have been kind of driving uh, what has been happening over the last few years. One is the emergence of violence in the political sphere. The emergence of violence, I don't want to go to back to history, uh, was, not, uh, was a major factor in the evolution of the political climate. And the violence which has two dimensions, well, one is the terrorist you know, component of it, and one is the political part of it. 
I don't want to go into the details, but this is, was one of the major factors that have fueled the tensions that we have seen over the, over the, over the years build up and has helped polarize more the society and polarize the political sphere, if you like. Uh, so one of the, uh, of the tasks of the new government is to bring that under control because this is critical for any political process and any electoral process to be transparent and to be fair it is that the political climate is free from political violence, if you like. So uh, the terrorist activity is still, is still with us. There have been a number of actions and the security forces have been able to start to control somewhat the situation, but we are not sure how much. Yesterday, so those of you who heard the Prime Minister, as Mohammed says that, he said that we have made progress, but we still have a lot to do on that front. It's not, it's not a problem that is gone away. It's still there and still, uh, it's still with us. Uh, the second dimension of the violence is, is also still with us and has not been resolved fully. And it's, so we still have to see how over the next few months the new government as well as the whole political establishment deals with that issue and gets to control that issue. So we are still, so constitution or no constitution, that problem is still, is still there somewhat. Hopefully, it's starting to be uh, brought under control. It's starting to be, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, reduced to minimal impact on the political situation, but this remains to be seen. So that's one, the first one. The first, the second, the second issue is the political, the political one and the political polarization and, and so on. Clearly, the, uh, my, my sense is that the Constitution is, is a good step because it has helped to resolve some of the differences and get consensus on a number of things. But I think, uh, I'm not sure that polarization is gone forever. Polarization can come back very quickly. And the political climate can become, again, very uh, polarized and very hot. So, um, and this can be on any issues, whether it's issues that have been dealt with within the Constitution or issues that have not been dealt with political issues in, on their own. Uh, I'm sure that with the uh, electoral process uh, and with the elections starting, I think we are going to see more of that. So hopefully, hopefully uh, this will not get out of hand. Uh, we have to go beyond polarization toward better understand, I mean, uh, the political climate and, you know, different components of the political spectrum have to understand that they have to live together in, in some sense. Within the rules of the, of the Constitution as, as, as understood and as agreed, if you like. And the, the, the problem is that many of these things are uh, subject to interpretation. And then we have to get to understand, to get processes in, in, in place to, uh, to have uh, a better understanding of what we have agreed on and implemented and so on. But this is not, this is not uh, a done deal and uh, I think this remains a challenge, I think, as we go forward. Uh, the risks of political polarization and of uh, worsening political climate. I hope that the progress that we have made over the three months will be consolidated rather than going backward. As well. But my concern is really, as, as of today, is on the third front, on the financial and economic front. This is really what my concern is. <coughs> For years, uh, I think, uh, I don't want to say that I was right, and it's not, it's not my point here, but I was saying it from early on, from two th early 2011. I was saying, be careful, don't disconnect the economics from politics. Don't think that economics can live on its own, and then you can do whatever you want on the political front, and then the economy will be there, you know, doing the right thing and getting it. And I said that, Sooner or later, 
if the political climate gets bad enough and the economy get bad in, get, gets bad enough, then we are in big trouble. Because the, the economy needs clear rules, clear prospects. Need, investors need certainty or as the least possible uncertainty. Need clear prospects. Need to know where the policies are going. What are the policies that are being pursued and so on. And if this is not happening, then the economy will go down, financial situation will go down, and then we are in big trouble. And then I was fearing the negative feedback loop between worsening economic and financial conditions and worsening social and political conditions. And I am afraid that we may be in that loop now. Despite all of the progress that we have done over the last few months in this. Why I'm saying that? Because actually, while we are expecting the recovery to strengthen in 2012 and 2013, it did not. We, are, we know now that 2013 was the, the economic outcomes were pretty weak. The growth was very weak. The macro balances have got a big hit, big deficits on the, on the current account balance big deficits on the fiscal front. And we learned yesterday that the situation is much, much worse than what we thought on the fiscal front. And we have been warning about this. We have been warning for months, but be careful about the financial situation. Be careful about the fiscal situation. And so now we are finding ourselves today, as we go forward in the next few months, to face very, very tough situation on the fiscal front. The numbers that were said yesterday by the Prime Minister are, are staggering in terms of fiscal deficit and how it, it has to be met. I don't have all the details because it seems that the numbers that are coming out are much worse than even the ones I thought I knew about. There are new numbers which seem to be coming out from the new uh, you know, diagnostic that was done by the new government and so on. So the question is, how are we going to deal with that? Because what we fear most, and what I fear most, is that the, while we need to strengthen and stimulate the economy more so that we improve the economic conditions, we bring hope to the young population which needs jobs, we need to stimulate the growth, to have growth, we need to spend more, and so on, we, may, we, might, need to ha we might have to do the, the opposite. We might have to go into reducing expenditures, cutting benefits, and uh, having more borrowing, even domestically, because the Prime Minister announced yesterday mobilization of $500 million or some dinners or, or I don't know, the Minister of Finance or somebody by mobilizing a domestic bond issue of 500 million dinars. What does that mean? It means that if the government starts to borrow much more, to give you 500 million dinars is uh, the government has traditionally been borrowing on the domestic market about 1.4 billion dinars on average. 1.5. Over the last year, it has gone up to 2 billion, I don't know, 2 billion, 2 or 2.3 2 or something like that. So increasing by 500 million is a big jump again. So if you, are, if you are pulling so much resources for the government, there is not much left for the private sector. So where is it going to come? Where is the investment going to come? How are you going to have the private sector and the banking sector finance uh, the private sector and, and, and the growth. It's going to be really a very difficult situation for the private sector and for growth as we go forward. And if the employment prospects don't improve, if investment does not improve, if the social situation does not improve, this is not going to help the electoral process. This is not going to help the political process and so on. So uh, I'm afraid that after this positive energy that has been built over the next two years, I mean, reality is going to hit us over the next few weeks and months. 
So my message is the following. My message is that in as much as, it, as we were under very difficult conditions toward the end of 2013, and we had a national dialogue to agree on the political front and to get a consensus on what needs to be done on the constitution, government, um, we are really in bad need now to activate the, the, the national dialogue on the economic and financial front. We are in a very serious need today. If we want to preserve you know, a positive outlook and this positive energy, we need to get on the economic front a national dialogue going on to agree on the things that we need to do because we need to do difficult things. And we have to have a consensus on these difficult things that need to be done. And only a national dialogue, some type, whether it's the same one or a different one and different format or something, this remains to be seen. But my sense is that this is what we really badly need today. If we want to build the conditions and to ensure the conditions for the electoral process to go on in reasonable conditions so that we have peaceful and transparent elections as, as we go forward by the end of the year, we need to deal with these economic issues. We need to avoid getting into this negative feedback loop I'm, I was talking about. If we don't, we might be in for very, very difficult times. I hope that everybody will feel that the economy is as important as politics and as a national dialogue is as important for the economic and financial issues as it was for the political issues so that we can face these difficult times that we, are, where we have today. So uh, if we do so, if we do so, if we do so and, and we have, we succeed. And we succeed in going through this difficult uh, economic and <coughs> fiscal uh, situation. And then we succeed in having good elections which are transparent and so on. Then we are really, we, we, we are probably in a very good position uh, going <coughs> forward of the next few years. We still have a lot of things to do because we, are not, we have not started to deal with the structural issues, the basic deep reforms on the economy and social front and so on. But if we go, if over this 2014, if we go over this hump of 2014, the financial hump and the fiscal hump and the economic difficulties, and we succeed in the electoral process, then we are opening a new prospects for us. So, but it's hard, it's hard work and we need to continue doing it. Let me ask of you. Thank you, Sir Mustafa. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, certainly the call for a national dialogue on economic matters will al also empower the governments, you know, or at least give them more leverage uh, and more tools to uh, make reforms that are needed, you know, to address the, the fiscal situation that you are describing. So thank you for, for this input. Um, as we're talking about the economy, uh, I want to turn to my second speaker, uh, Bo Cutter. Let me introduce Bo uh, very briefly. Uh, Bo has been the Director of Economic Policy at the Roosevelt Institute since 2009. Uh, when he retired uh, at that point in time from Warburg Pincus, which is one of the leading private equity firms in the world. Uh, he served uh, two administrations. He was the Director of Office, and Management, of Office of Management and Budget under President Carter. And then uh, he was one of the top economic advisors of President Clinton uh, during his, uh, his first mandate. He serves in so many uh, <laughs> boards and is the chair of a number of boards, in particular the chair of CARE, the largest NGO in the world, uh, and the chair of Microvest, one of the leading uh, uh, microfinance institution in the world. And he is also the chair of the Tunisian American Enterprise Fund, which is a hundred million dollar fund that was established by the U.S. government uh, to support the transition in Tunisia and in particular to support the private sector growth uh, and SMEs. So, Bo, welcome. Thank you for, uh, for, uh, for uh, coming. Uh, I guess my question to you, you've been to Tunisia a few times and you've sort of get a, got a sense you know, of some of the economic challenges that exist in the country, um, some sense on the doing business in Tunisia, some sense of the entrepreneurship ecosystem. 
What are some of you, your thoughts about what you've seen, and then what is the Enterprise Fund vision, and what are you planning to do in, in the next few months? <clears throat> Those are fair questions. They're hard. Hi, everybody. Um, it's. I just want to underline the difficulty of the circumstance because on the on to my immediate left is one of my board members, and one over who's just finished talking is one of my most important advisors in in Tunis. So I will. I'm. I'm. Uh, what I'm really trying to do here is avoid maximum loss rather than rather than gain. Uh, Mr. Ambassadors, thank you very much for uh, for, for coming and uh, taking the time to, to hear us. Uh, <clears throat> let me make comments in three areas, and in the interest of giving everybody time to ask questions, I, I'll be I'll be pretty fast. Uh, one is just a comment on the current situation. Uh, it may be well. I'll make it, and then then uh, I won't characterize it. The second is. Is, is a comment about the economy. And then a third, what I hope follows from that, is a comment about the fund. Uh, let, me <clears throat> let me open with just a comment about the, the current circumstance and what, from, the, from an outsider's perspective, uh, what, what's really striking. And I think I have to begin in a way that is that perhaps restores somewhat of the optimism, which is that this was a profoundly important accomplishment, is what, what's happened over the last three years. And yeah, it's hard, but, it, but it's profoundly important. And it's profoundly difficult. Uh, I will, I'd suggest, I was reading last night, the, uh, and I'd suggest that to all of you, The Economist's uh, essay that's a six-page essay that's uh, that's in this week's edition on democracy, and I won't I won't try to summarize at all. But in essence, what it says is that democracy everywhere is under attack. Uh, democracies are very hard to establish, and they're even harder to sustain. Uh, and what we've just heard, and I'll comment more on that, is a more graphic illustration of that. But there was something quite fundamental that happened in this decision uh, and in, in the decisions that, that have been taken over the course of the last couple of years. And it's not simply, and by those decisions I mean not simply the, the actual decisions, but the decisions that were taken to have a dialogue in the first place, to be willing to participate in it with some, with, some with openness and some transparency. And it's kind of the ultimate realization that by definition in democracies there are no final victories. Uh, you never win at all. And if you've ever been in a position of, of senior policy leadership or a senior political position, you learn that every day, is that you never win. Uh, every time you win, it's, it's kind of a compromise. And that is very, very hard to convince people to do in a, in a world in which um, they, there's some tendency to see each other as enemies. I won't digress into the United States, but it's a lesson that we in the United States seem to be bent on unlearning uh, while Tunisia tries to learn it. But, so the, the, the first point I really want to make is the profound importance of what's happened and the enormous difficulty. And if you've not served in a government, if you've not been in politics, you don't know how hard it has been to accomplish what was accomplished. Now let me turn more to the economy. Um, the, there's going to be a trans transitional government now in place, I would bet, for the best part of 2014. Who knows precisely how long? I certainly don't, but uh, it's, it's, it, it, has a, it has a ways to run. And it's a government that has a dilemma which is that almost by definition, it lacks the, de the, the basis of consent to do much, but it shouldn't and it can't do nothing. Uh, so what is it, what's it gonna do? I mean, any, anybody in a role like that has to constantly balance and has to constantly think about, as opposed to what I want to do, what is it I actually can do? And the, I would think this government faces that problem more than, more than um, more than any I've been in, yet at, the, yet at the same time it can't stand still. Uh, you yourself have said that to me a couple of times. Uh, 
Now, I'm not a Tunisian, and uh, chairing the uh, TAEF doesn't give me any standing to make any specific policy advice, but I have uh, had fairly senior economic policy roles, and I've thought about uh, this economy. Uh, so let me make a couple of thoughts. The first is that I did an exercise for myself in which I took kind of standard growth accounting, and I asked myself under two kind of different judgments what was the long-range potential growth rate of Tunisia. And you can, can, come, can come to profoundly different answers. If you take the numbers as they currently exist and you say those don't change very much, uh, then other than a few efficiency gains on the side, the, the long-run potential growth rate of the Tunisian economy is not a hell of a lot different than the growth rate it's achieved in the last couple of years, which is not good news. But if you then look at other possibilities within Tunisia, you come to, the, to an argument that the growth rate should be very, very considerably in excess of what has been achieved over the last couple of years. So there is a question about how do you get from one to the other. Um, not seen much good analysis of that since our previous speaker left the central bank. Um, I, you know, I did a little bit of my own. And what I really did was go out and look at various indices. And essentially, I looked at five. Doing business, economic competitiveness, um, the uh, uh, hu human development, <clears throat> economic freedom, and entrepreneurship and development. I won't bother you about going through each of these, but the story essentially is that with one exception, and I'll come to the exception, Tunisia's kind of middle of the pack. Uh, sometimes sort of toward the bottom quarter, sometimes a little higher than that, but basically middle of the pack. In the, on the index of entrepreneurship and growth, uh, entrepreneurship and development, it, 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 it performs very poorly. It's very low. Uh, the, now what's this say to me? It, it says to me that <clears throat> in a world where value-added is going to be the only way that's, that, that small economies, and particularly in small economies that don't ha aren't afflicted by the resource curse, uh, can uh, have to function, becoming a value-added economy somehow is the only way out of the trap. Now let me go back to uh, the transitional government. The government in, faces a really difficult task, is that it has to, on the one hand, contend with the short-run difficulties that we just talked about in what was, I meant to say this right at the start, but th this was a very wise set of comments you just heard, and I would uh, suggest you don't often hear those in a panel, that, that I, I thought the way in which you drew out the dilemmas was, was, was remarkably clear. Uh, government has to deal with those. But at the same time, if that's all the government did, then Tunisia is still stuck in a cul-de-sac. And so more has to be done than that. But it's not a government that has the actual consent, it has the political base to be able to do it. Which brought me, strangely enough, to the same conclusion that you had is that the only, what, what this government has to do more than anything else is tell the truth. What this government has to do is lay out with some precision where the economy is. Uh, I think, uh, I've, uh, but I've oft, uh, often argued this in our own government and only on occasion got very far, is that it should lay out some of these indices. Uh, and lay them out in terms that ordinary people understand them. And say what, do we have to do to be the most competitive economy in the world? Um, uh, Singapore has half the population of Tunisia and eight times the uh, per capita GDP. Uh, it, it didn't get there by accident. So what do you have to do? And I think the only way you get there is both by, by very good analysis that you make public and second by the kind of national dialogue that you suggested. Let me switch from that, and I think it fits, to a point about the TAEF. Um, and what I 
what I need to do and want to do at the start is just underline what an enormous honor this is for me. Uh, and to thank President Clinton and Secretary, uh, President, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a slip, uh, is President Obama and Secretary Clinton uh, for, for naming me in the first place. Um, it actually wasn't a future-oriented slip, it was just, a, a, it was just, it was just dementia and remembering my previous, my previous life. Uh, we can interpret <laughs> <laughs> um, the, it wasn't, when Hillary talked to me about it, it wasn't something that I regarded as, oh gee, maybe I have to do this because Hillary wants me to do it and she says the president wants me to do it. It's, it's I, I grabbed for it as soon as it was offered. This struck, struck me as a wonderful opportunity to do something worthwhile in a field that I actually knew something about. Uh, but I, as I've thought about it, I try to approach this, and our board is trying to approach this from the same perspective that I just talked about with respect to the, 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 the issues that the government of, of, Tunis, of Tunisia now faces, um, which is that our, <clears throat> our real goal is to make the TAEF a high value added development tool uh, by trying to build a high value added uh, private sector. You're not going to see us do a few deals. I've done a thousand deals in my lifetime. Um, the, this, our board could do, do, do a set of deals in our sleep. Uh, we'd do them, we'd go away, the wave, the water would wash over and you'd never know we were there. Uh, this isn't the way things were when the first enterprise funds were set up in Eastern Europe and there was no private sector. There's a sophisticated private sector in Tunisia. It's efficient, inefficient at times, it doesn't work as well as it should, it's got all kinds of blockages, but nevertheless the, 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 there's, it's, it's quite sophisticated. Uh, an, another component that just kind of does the same thing is not something that Tunis needs and Tunisia needs and it's not something I need to do. Um, what you will see um, is us try to do four things and I'll, I'll, I'll name them and that kind of ends where I am. Uh, the first is we're going to build a small number of sustainable, profitable platforms uh, in key sectors and, uh, and we are going to make those, sec those platforms major sector, major figures, major elements in those sectors uh, and what we hope is that each will contribute to the development of a substantial sector into us. The second is, is that we're going to, with respect to each of those platforms, raise more money. Um, I think if we do this right, uh, that the, the, the a platform strategy coupled with the goodwill of the Tunisian government, coupled with the support of the United States, that we can, that we can pretty easily raise more money. So I do not, I don't see my job uh, over the next few years as doing deals. We will do deals, but I'm not going to do them. I see my job as going out and raising more money, to be, to be blunt about it. Third, uh, in, do, in the doing of this, what we really want to do is build a specialized flow of investment. It doesn't do us any good, and it doesn't do the fund, and it doesn't do the country any good if we just kind of do make investments that come in over the transom because somebody decided they wanted to put a piece of paper in front of us. Uh, what we need to do is through a, d a deliberate strategy is build a flow of, forgive the term, deals uh, that both we and others would want to invest in and that contribute to the growth of the sectors. Um, what we'll do is offer those to all of the players in Tunisia. I, d I do not see the fund in a, in a competition with existing players. I, I see us as a partner, I see us as a co-venturer, and frankly I see us as, as having capital that we can use in a somewhat different way. So for example, we'll often be willing to take first loss um, on deals in order to bring others into the party. And finally what I want to do is take advantage of our unique situation, uh, which is kind of a bridge between the uh, between Tunisia and the United States. There are other bridges. I don't argue for a second we're the only one. Uh, but in the, in, in the economic world, between Tunisia and 
the private sector and in the investment private sector of the United States, where we can be a pretty special one. And what I'd like to do, and what our board very much wants to do, is to use that, that, that positioning to bring the best, the most innovative thinking in the U.S. and in the, in the investment world and the world of developing accelerators, of, of, of developing early stage businesses, <coughs> to our work in Tunisia. So those are the four things we're going to do. Uh, the, what we hope comes out of that is a profitable is is a profitable fund but and i but i see that as necessary but not sufficient what i see as sufficient is is being able to show that we made a reasonably significant impact on the kinds of pro pro problems that all of you know exist uh, so those are my three points uh and i'd i'd end by saying that the that the what that the real point or the the real discussion here uh, and this is not having heard the next two, but it is uh, the one you really should carry away with you are the comments that you made at the start. I, mean, I thought, found that they were remarkably perceptive and they put the, 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 the position of the government and the economy in precisely the right place. Thank you, Bo. I, I was going to say that just like C. Mustafa is building his fan club in D.C., you're, sh you're slowly but surely building yours in Tunisia. That'd be wonderful. I'd rather <laughs> have one there than here. <laughs> um, but, you, you know, I think your comment about value added is, is absolutely uh, on the point because in an economy like Tunisia, you know, with 11 million people, you know, the way we've been running the country in terms of sort of a low price strategy, whether it's tourism or textile, that's not sustainable. We can't compete against people who have billions. And so definitely adding that value is, is absolutely necessary. So let me turn to my third speaker. We're going to switch the topic a little bit to politics and security. Uh, Alexis uh, Ariaf is an analyst at the Congressional Research Service. Um, the Congressional Research Service is an entity uh, within Congress that provides independent uh, and nonpartisan research to members of Congress uh, and their staff. And she's been working on Tunisia for a number of, uh, of years, on Francophone Africa as well. She's a graduate from Yale. Um, and uh, Alexis, you know, Simustafa was talking about sort of this political truce that's happening today in Tunisia. H how long do you see that lasting, especially in a climate where elections are coming up? And what is your assessment on sort of the security situation? What's happening at the border in Libya, in Algeria? What is going on? Thank you for the, for the introduction and thanks for the for the opportunity to be on this panel. I was just getting to the point where I was like, maybe I just shouldn't say anything, for the, which I, I will try to be a somewhat minimalist, I think, in my comments, especially looking at it, the audience. I imagine that sort of a, a Q and A discussion afterwards will be will be robust. Um, I'm also counting on you to edit out my snow boots from the video. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, so I. I I guess I'm just going to make a couple of very quick points because I think that you know, the, the core political and policy dilemmas have really been, been captured already by my much more capable um, fellow panelists. Um, I, I, at the beginning when we were talking about, uh, Mohammed, your vision for this panel and, and you were talking about risks ahead and sort of key challenges, um, I guess I see them really falling into these two categories. Uh, one sort of the political process and where we go from here, and then the second one, uh, how to deal with these security issues. And I see a similar uh, dilemma for the transitional authorities on security um, that you outlined for the economy, um, but I, I guess I can get into that a little bit. Um, I, I think to step back um, and, and, and just remind us all of the context, from the beginning, Tunisia was seen as having the best chance of any state in the Arab world of making a peaceful transition to uh, democracy, or at least greater democracy from authoritarian rule. And in a lot of ways, the events of the last few months have, have sort of justified that optimism. But the events of the last three years have also reminded us that it's not easy and that it's challenging and that therefore those challenges are likely to, to remain for the foreseeable future. And in a lot of ways, you know, 
as as you said, you know, welcome to democracy. Uh, it's hard, and it never and and challenges never never exit and never never go away. Um, and I think that that adjustment in Tunisian in the Tunisian public's mindset is going to be a big challenge. Moving from a system where the public uh, is largely absent from the political process, uh, where there sort of was no political, you know, there were no politics uh, in, the, in the old Tunisia, toward one in which individuals bear responsibility for policy decisions, in which uh, you have to decide who to vote for and then live with the consequences, that's going to be a, an enormous shift in sort of individual mindsets. And I think that, you know, as Americans, we've been grappling with this for uh, you know, decades and centuries, and we still, you know, many of us still are sort of wrapping our heads around that responsibility, and that's, that's going to be very, very, very difficult. Um, I, I would also say that e even though Tunisia's uh, exemplary nature has been somewhat demonstrated over the last couple of months, unfortunately for the rest of the region, its example might have less influence than we all might like. It might have less influence than uh, larger states like Egypt or more geographically central states like Syria. So uh, for the foreseeable future, Tunisia will be struggling uh, will continue to be struggling in a region where broader trend lines are very are very negative, and I think that that's going to be uh, uh, very very difficult. Um, I, so to come back to sort of my uh, two main challenges, one is the political process. As we all know, a, a gulf of mistrust between Islamist and secularist political factions, but also within those factions, and I think that's less discussed. Um, has been fed by rising insecurity and by mutual suspicions that each side seeks to manipulate the rules of the game uh, to exclude the other. The Constitution is an enormous step forward in assuaging some of those fears because it does lay the groundwork for a fair and open political competition uh, among parties, but it's not enough. It's never going to be enough, and these uh, fears will probably resurface um, as was mentioned during the electoral process, but also future electoral processes and future political debates over issues of national importance. Um, these suspicions also have been affected by uh, the July 2013 military ouster of, of President Morsi in Egypt, um, although those events also arguably in retrospect might have provided needed impetus to political factions in Tunisia to come back to the negotiating table and work something out because the alternatives are quite dire. Um, overall, the new constitution reflects a very complex process of adjudicating stark policy differences over the future shape of Tunisia's state and society. Uh, ultimately, while uh, the constitution has been justifiably heralded as an important compromise between Islamists and secularists, the degree to which it truly lays the foundation for a democratic, stable political system is likely depend to depend on future actions. Um, in particular on constitutional interpretation and implementation, on the degree to which the judiciary and the legislature and new administrative bodies leverage their new authorities, and whether additional steps are taken to reform state institutions, particularly the Ministry of Interior, um, but also other core um, state entities. The new constitution is also unlikely to definitively settle, because it would be impossible to do so, ongoing debates about the state's regulation of religious activities, about the legal status of Salafist groups, um, and over how to balance freedom of expression and religious sensibilities. In other words, many of the core policy debates between Islamists and secularists will now be kicked back to the political process, which I think is probably a positive thing on balance, but again, it's something that Tunisians uh, will have to prepare themselves for, uh, a messy political um, process in which um, new precedents might be set by the judiciary or by political bodies or by the new constitutional court that probably won't satisfy everyone. Um, and that's normal in a democracy, but, but um, again, difficult to grapple with. Uh, Anaga leader Rashid Ghanoushi, in his recent visit to Washington, uh, committed to forming a coalition government if Nada uh, wins a plurality or even a majority in future elections, and suggested that the party will not field a presidential candidate um, in elections expected later this year. 
However, uh, Tunisians may, in fact, are, Tunisians are likely to find that it's not always possible or necessarily desirable to settle uh, policy divisions through consensus. At some point, um, democratic mechanisms have to come into play. Ultimately, voting and popular support matter, and transitioning from these consensual elite dialogues into more normalized uh, political processes will be, uh, will be something to manage in the years to come. The second big challenge that I would identify is how to deal with violent extremism, both within Tunisia's borders uh, and by Tunisian nationals abroad. Um, violent extremist groups such as AQIM, it's Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, it's offshoots, it's affiliated groups, um, are uh, attempting to capitalize at the regional level on divisive identity issues, as well as popular frustration with the slow pace of reforms throughout the region. The State Department earlier this year designated Ansar Sharia in Tunisia, um, a Tunisian Salafist organization, as a foreign terrorist organization, accusing it of involvement in the 2012 attack on the US Embassy at American School in Tunis, um, and stating that the group, quote, represents the greatest threat to US interests in Tunisia, unquote, currently. Um, Tunisian security forces have repeatedly clashed with armed militants, uh, reportedly including foreign fighters, but also Tunisian nationals, along the mountainous border with Algeria in a region called um, Mount Shambi, and in the remote south near Libya. Under the Nada-led government last year, the military was deployed to Mount Shambi. Uh, Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia was declared a terrorist organization and an illegal, uh, an illegal organization, and senior officials repeatedly promised to crack down on uh, violence um, by extremists and others. Yet the state's response to Ansar Sharia and other Salafist groups has been criticized both as overly timid by secularist groups and as overly broad and un, uh, undemocratic uh, by members of uh, the Islamist community and, and in some cases civil libertarians, underscoring the challenges for Tunisian leaders of uh, countering terrorism and violent extremism while not appearing to resort to authoritarian tactics associated with the former regime. Um, related challenges include the status of Tunisia's uh, 2003 anti-terrorism law uh, and more broadly security sector reform and reform in, in particular of the internal security services and Ministry of Interior. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that and we can get into more detail in the Q&A. Thank you, Alexis. Um, so let me turn to our last speaker, uh, Stephen McInerney, uh, who is the executive director of the Project for Middle East Democracy, uh, POMED. Uh, by the way, if, if you want uh, good, accurate, concise information on Tunisia, POMED uh, actually publishes a weekly wire uh, of sort of all the main information. It's very well done, so I'd recommend it highly. Um, Stephen has done um, a lot of research on Egypt, but has spent al also a lot of time uh, in Tunisia. Um, and, um, you know, Stephen, what, what I think what we want to talk about is more sort of your impression on uh, the, uh, the political developments, uh, and also in particular uh, some of sort of what the U.S. could be doing to uh, further support the transition in Tunisia. Thanks very much, Mohammed. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, I also it, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel. And I, I've very much enjoyed the, the insights that I've heard so far, uh, particularly on the economic side, um, which uh, I couldn't agree more it is extremely important. You know, enormous challenges facing uh, Tunisia now uh, for the very important political progress uh, that has been made uh, to, on one hand, continue because there's still important steps that need to be taken politically, but also it has to be ac accompanied by economic progress and economic success. Uh, and I, I would agree with the remarks that uh, a lot of the important steps that need to be taken economically, need to be taken economically, have been avoided up until now and sort of put off. Um, and uh, Mr. Nubley's sort of sobering remarks about the situation uh, economically that Tunisia finds itself in. Um, I, I think we're very, very insightful. Uh, I will, uh, first I, I would just briefly echo everyone else's remarks about the really historic nature of what Tunisia has achieved. And despite how difficult it has been, and despite the enormous challenges that still remain, uh, I, I think that 
the progress that, that has taken place politically is ex extraordinarily important, and not only just for Tunisia, but I think for the entire region. Uh, and, uh, and while I would agree with Alexis's comment that uh, the progress and what developments in Tunisia don't have the kind of immediate uh, spillover effects across the region uh, that events in, in larger countries such as Egypt would have. Uh, I, I do believe that in the longer term, if Tunisia can continue down this path and have sustained you know, political success and, and a genuine transition uh, to democracy that's accompanied by prosperity and economic success, I think in the longer term, uh, the first country in the Arab world that can achieve that uh, will have an enormous impact on the entire region uh, and, and will uh, you know, hopefully you know, set a, a, an example and a model that can be looked to uh, and sort of demonstrate as hollow. Uh, I mean, a lot of the authoritarian regimes in, in the region uh, you know, sort of uh, put forth this argument that while things may not be perfect here and you may not have the freedoms that you want, uh, but things are okay, and I, this, you know, this regime provides stability, and if you push, you might get what they're, you know, the alternative is, for example, what we see in Syria or what we see in Egypt, and I, I think it could be extraordinarily important for Tunisia to show that, no, that, that there is uh, an alternative and to kind of uh, demonstrate as hollow these, these arguments that you often hear from, from the non-democratic regimes uh, that are in place. Uh, along with this sort of historic and, and very important uh, nature uh, of, of the success that, that we've seen in Tunisia, I, I think that it should be viewed as extremely important uh, to the United States government and to European governments. Uh, and uh, I, our organization hosted an event last week uh, in which uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, uh, Bill Roebuck, uh, attended and spoke. And I was very pleased uh, to hear him uh, describe support for Tunisia's uh, transition, democratic transition, as a, quote, a top priority uh, of, of the administration. Uh, I, I, I think that's welcome. I think that's deserved. Uh, I think that's what it should be. I, I wouldn't say it should be the top priority of the administration in the, in the region, but it should be a top priority. Uh, and But uh, on the other hand, I would caution uh, that if that's true, then the United States must do much more than we've seen so far. Uh, the, the reality is that up until now, uh, the tr neither the transition in Tunisia nor any of the other transitions uh, to democracy have been top priorities of this administration in the region. The top priorities have been dealing with Iran, currently the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace process, uh, also Syria, uh, and so if uh, if this is sincere, and I very much hope that it is, uh, then it will need to be followed uh, by serious action and serious support. And I think that that support is deserved. Uh, this administration, as well as European governments, have often over the last three years talked about using positive incentives and rewards uh, for governments th that, that make progress. Uh, in 2011, uh, Catherine Ashton in the EU uh, gave uh, a number of speeches in which he referenced this concept of more for more. Uh, this administration had proposed a, a Middle East and North Africa incentive fund uh, the last couple of years that was not actually funded by Congress, but the idea was to provide economic support uh, to governments uh, that took the risk of, of, of uh, moving in the direction of both political and economic reform. And all of this logic to me says that the, at this point, the success that Tunisia has, has made economically uh, uh, sorry, politically should be uh, rewarded with uh, with uh, support internationally. Uh, I, I've said previously uh, at, at other events uh, that uh, I think that the Western countries and those countries that want to see democracy in the region uh, should be committed uh, into trying to support uh, Tunisia's transition in the same kind of way uh, that the Gulf countries, and the, uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in particular, are committed to trying to support uh, the su success of the military coup in Egypt. Uh, they, they don't want to, they've invested, you know, uh, more than 10 billion in trying to uh, achieve, achieve success there uh, because that's the model that they would like to see. I think the United States and European government should want to see a democratic model in Tunisia succeed. I would actually refine that comparison 
And not that they should play, I think the U.S. and European countries should not try to play the same role, but a, a smarter, better role uh, than what the Gulf countries are doing in Egypt. What you're seeing in Egypt is not uh, support uh, that sustainably is addressing any of Egypt's problems. They're trying to invest very heavily uh, in uh, sort of short-term, not sustainable ways, trying to avoid the kind of reforms that are needed both politically and economically in Egypt, and instead patch them over with band-aids. What I would like to see is a similar, similar level of commitment, but a much smarter one along the lines that some of the other speakers uh, have described in terms of uh, helping bring about you know, the kind of success that Tunisia needs. I'll just quickly uh, say a, a few things that I think that that, that support uh, could include. And, and I think that support uh, entails several different types of, of support. Right? One is sort of symbolic support. Um, you know, I, I think it's important that uh, steps be taken to demonstrate confidence uh, in Tunisia's uh, transition and demonstrate its importance and demonstrate a commitment to, to uh, you know, sticking with it in the future. Uh, I, I think it was uh, you know, welcome that Secretary Kerry recently uh, visited Tunisia. Uh, however, I would like to see you know, more of those kind of visits. His visit was rather brief. It was about three hours. It was his first visit uh, to Tunisia as Secretary. Uh, the first visit by a Secretary of State in, in nearly two years, uh, as contrasted with uh, about 20 trips that he's taken uh, focused on either the, the peace process or, or, or Syria. So again, if this is a top priority, I'd like to see you know, more investment. I'd like to see President Obama uh, visit, visit Tunisia as well. Uh, I do think it's very important uh, that they've invited, uh, that Obama has invited uh, Prime Minister Mehdi Joma here to visit Washington. Uh, but I, I also think that it will be important on that visit uh, to have some tangible uh, you know, new initiatives that can be announced uh, that, that demonstrate support uh, for Tunisia. Uh, another very important symbolic move uh, that I think could be taken, uh, although I understand that it's difficult, uh, is uh, reevaluating and, and uh, changing and ideally removing or at least uh, weakening dramatically the current uh, travel warning that the State Department has uh, about the situation in Tunisia. Uh, I, I think that it's uh, extremely damaging. It sends, first, it limits the, the ability of the U.S. Embassy in Tunisia and uh, not only the U.S. Embassy, but other U.S. government personnel uh, to play a supporting role in Tunisia. Uh, there were numerous meetings uh, in Tunisia last year that were unable to take place because of the security restrictions that are in place. Uh, there was an important meeting that was supposed to take place on security sector reform that had to be moved to Morocco because uh, the restrictions in place don't allow it to, uh, to take place in, in, in Tunisia. Uh, while I recognize that there are security risks, I think that the current uh, restrictions that are in place uh, are simply uh, disproportionate and not in line with the, with the current realities there. Uh, I've heard from staff that work at the embassy there that the kind of restrictions that they uh, face are similar to those that were in place uh, for embassy staff and personnel in places like Afghanistan and, and Iraq during wars. And myself, having been out to Tunisia, I think, you know, seven or eight times in the last couple of years, uh, can attest that, that that's simply not the reality on the ground. In addition to limiting the ability of the United States uh, personnel and others to, to operate in Tunisia, uh, this travel warning uh, and restrictions also send an extremely negative signal uh, to the international community and especially to the business community. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's, it's very important some of the steps that have been taken, uh, such as the Enterprise Fund and others, to help encourage investment in Tunisia. But I hear often from Tunisians that uh, it's, it's undercut by the signal that's sent, uh, especially I, I hear in the United States and in France, by this kind of warnings and also by the media coverage that send a signal that Tunisia is, is a dangerous and unstable place. Uh, and uh, that discourages investment, it also dis discourages tourism, uh, both of which are extremely important uh, to, to Tunisia's uh, economic recovery. Um, the, the final thing I'd say is that uh, I'd like to see the kind of political so and economic support, including you know, further economic assistance in different and creative ways, uh, as well as you know, further support for trade and investment. I'd also like to see that accompanied uh, by an effort by the international community, by the pro-democracy international community, uh, to help Tunisia's leaders uh, to take difficult decisions. And I think we, we've heard uh, from some of our other speakers 
uh, that in order to you know, have the kind of success that, that's needed in Tunisia, uh, its leaders have got to you know, face a difficult situation and move forward uh, and take steps that will have short-term negative consequences. And I think it's important that Tunisia's leaders get the, a strong uh, commitment from the international community that they, that they will have the support they need that will allow them to take the steps needed uh, for Tunisia in the long run uh, and to sort of survive uh, the, the short-term costs uh, that come with some of those decisions. Uh, that, that, you know, that includes economic reforms, uh, reforming some of the bureaucracies that have, uh, that have not been addressed, uh, security sector reform, uh, and the continuing building of uh, democratic institutions. So I'll leave my remarks there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Those are a set of symbolic actions that are absolutely needed. <laughs> Agree. Um, well, let me just want to, you know, give ample uh, time for questions. And so I'll open it up to um, questions to the panel. If you can introduce yourself and, uh, you know, uh, state your affiliation. Bill? Each or two of the panelists. Uh, Bill Lawrence, I am the um, a professor here at GW and I have other hats as well. Um, for Mr. Nebley, um, Tunisia has, relative to its size, the most successful business uh, class in, in the North Africa region. Um, it has very, very pragmatic businessmen and, and has proven it has the most diverse, and this is what, one of the reasons Tunisia is the most diverse economy in North Africa. Um, but the political class has this whole other articulation, anti-neoliberalism, you know, there's a lot of very antiquated ideas about, about economic, uh, how to move forward economically, and a lot of the se secular forces, let's say on our half or your half of the political spectrum are not articulating uh, 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 agendas that, that are in line with what you and I might agree are the best sort of things that Tunisia needs economically. On top of that, if you talk to World Bank economists, they're reproducing a lot of this discourse about subsidies and fiscal health that, you know, considering the J curve that you often talk about, we're not there yet. Uh, your wife at the Atlantic Council today was talking about how important it is during this tough period to, to not cut back too much on salaries and subsidies because of the very insta unstable political situation we have right now. So given that, you know, how, how, do, how do you deal with this debate in Tunisia uh, between the, the anti-neoliberal crowd, which is so prominent on the left, and, and what Tunisia needs? And then for the, uh, 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 Mr. Crock, was it Crocker? Cutter. Yeah, Cutter. Um, uh, I had some experience uh, in the 2000s working on bringing IC squared and, and other groups to Tunisia to try to work on this, this very thing. Uh, one of the things we did in, in conjunction with that was um, looking into Tunisian venture capital capacity and we were shocked to find that it was basically one venture capitalist operating in Tunis. We had quite a bit of success but there was very little in that space. Investment in Tunisia, it's real estate, it's food, it's very little else. And so I was wondering how much you thought about the lack of venture capital capacity and other things of this nature in Tunisia in terms of your overall planning. I think the, uh, the issue that you put, um, the question is, is really one of the most central issues uh, for the medium run. I mean, I don't think it's something that you can do much about in the short run. But if, I mean, going to what Bo Qatar was saying earlier in terms of trying to think what is the potential growth rate in the future in Egypt, I think having that issue, making progress on that issue is going to be a determining factor. Because um, one of the paradoxes of the of the situation in Tunisia and the Arab countries as a whole and that uh, and 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 the way the revolution worked out and 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 how it came about and things like that that issue is really central to that because what happened very quickly I, I don't want to take too much time but just very broad outlines 
the the region, whether it's Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, you know, whatever, and, and Morocco, had essentially a statist development model in the 50s and the 60s. And they started, and then we started to change a little bit in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And then we had the private sector which started to emerge, okay? And, but the statist uh, mind has not changed, actually both in the political sphere as well as the bureaucratic sphere. So there has continued to be a tension between the need to release the energy of the private sector and then the willingness and the, to control by the political and the administrative. And that's why you have all these indicators that Bocatra was talking about in terms of the ease of doing business and, then, and, and all, of, all of that stuff. It's, it's the same story, story everywhere. What happened in the 2000s, essentially, is that the situation got even worse. Why? Because the cronyism between the political regimes and the private sector became an even worse problem. The private sector was seen as a lie to the uh, authoritarian regimes, and the authoritarian regimes were trying to use the private sector for their own purposes. So the marriage between the two made the, prob the private sector Part of the problem and the public opinion became increasingly negative towards the private sector, right? So the situation got even worse. So when the revolution came, the sentiment towards the private sector, you know, kind of worsened uh, a little bit and remained negative, broadly negative. So, so we are in this paradox today where, given the history, the attitudes, and the perceptions concerning the private sector as broadly negative by the population at large and the political class. It's not only the political class, I would go even further. And, and we see that in, uh, somewhat in, in, the, in the surveys, in the, in the global surveys. On the other hand, we know that there is no way to meet the challenge of growth and employment without a dynamic private sector. So we are in a kind of in a bind. How do you do that? So that's, that we have to bridge that gap. So one of the major things that we need to do over the next few years is really to bridge that gap. And how do we do it? It's really to deal with the source of the problem. First of all, we have to disconnect the association of the private sector with corruption. We have to disconnect the perception of the private sector with not contributing to the social Social good that means not paying taxes, you know, getting the benefits, but not contributing backward. So there is work to be done, both by the private sector, but also by the government, by society, by civil society, in order to change the perceptions, not only by just propaganda, but by actions. By actions, which dissociate the private sector, from. and the private sector has to do its own work as well. Has to to do things to show that it is uh, you know, perceiving these problems and then it has got to do its work in terms of being uh, socially responsible, being uh, sit, you know, responsible citizens in terms of contributing to the uh, you know, to, um, tax, uh, to tax uh, income and uh, being also aware of corruption and not using corruption as well. You know, if we build that, then you, then this, this distinction. Now, what, what is at risk? What is the? There is an additional problem that is going to come, uh, that is coming. We are starting to see it now. Is the private sector and the political and uh, the one that you have in the U.S. the links between the private sector and the electoral and the political process? So, fun, financing of political activities and so on. This. You know, you know, political, you know, election, electoral finance, and so on. This risk of making the problem even worse if we don't, if we are not careful enough. If we are not careful enough, and then we see and we start seeing the electoral process being captured and the political process being captured by the private sector, then the, the situation may be even worse. So this is a big challenge, and I, I think. You put your finger, it's, it's one of the biggest ones, and then we have to, to be working on it. But did you want to address the 
question? Sure, that you've got sure. It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> let me start with a couple. I'll just make points, kind of like PowerPoints. Uh, I won't explain them. But, uh, that begins where Mr. Neville was. Um, I've spent lots and lots of time in middle income and poor and and poor countries, the Tunisians, middle income. And the the first thing that struck me as I began to go there and read about it was how very very similar the structure of the economy is. That it's if I could characterize it, it's 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 a barbell economy. That the, that it has. Uh, it's it's top heavy, in, and you would have expected this from the nature of the government in the last two decades, three decades, and at the and and it has a very large mass at the bottom, and there's kind of no middle. Uh, the in an economy that that is going to survive by developing in my and thrive only, I think, by developing a really vibrant middle. So the middle's not there. Despite that. Uh, and you alluded to this, it, Tunisia has a much, much better business sector than you would have expected from seeing that. Uh, it, has, it has extremely sophisticated, uh, quite able b business people, uh, and a private sector that is, that's really much more interesting than I expected it to be before I started. My, all my previous times in Tunisia had been much more focused on kind of macro and aid and stuff like that over the time. Third, I was, the thing that has absolutely struck me, and this is a point that you just mentioned, is the s extraordinary difference in worldview between business people and people in government and politics, and I twin those together. Um, it, it is it's almost like C.P. Snow's the two, uh, the, the, the two cultures in the science or the scientific revolution is that you, you feel as if you're having different universes explained to you when you listen to the two classes explanation of the current circumstances in Tunisia. There's one that I obviously re res resonate with a lot more than another, but, but you see them there. All right, taking that down now to your question, which I wasn't trying to avoid. Uh, the, it's a little better than you saw at the time. Uh, there's a somewhat larger community. Uh, there are a couple of incubators with, with really capable people trying to make them work. Uh, there are some business angels. Uh, but there's not an ecology of, that would, that's truly supportive of an early stage business environment. And, and it is an opportunity I can list two or three opportunities that I think Tunisia is missing, but that's a big one. Given where it is, given its position in North Africa, given what's a few hundred miles to the north, uh, it ought to be a, a wonderful place, and it ought to be, there ought to be an ecology for, uh, uh, for, for, a, for a startup early stage kind of business. There isn't. I mean, that said, despite the fact they're very good people in it. And one of the platform businesses that we will create will be in that sector. And we will allocate a significant amount of our money. We will raise more. And the intent will be not for us to do, I'm sure we will do some, but not for us to do early stage deals, but for us to create an environment in which there are many, many more early stage deals and people who can support them. As a Tunisian student, I'm Thank you for bringing GW, um, Tunisia to GW, um, especially in this awful weather. It's good to be reminded of Tunisia. Um, so let's say you have magical powers um, and you, uh, I'd like to know exactly your ideas of how to reform the public sector and, uh, and the administration in Tunisia. Um, just, you know, some ideas that can be implemented on the long term, of course. Uh, Mr. Carter talks about the um, Singaporean example. Uh, what do you think can, can we, uh, what kind of examples can we uh, think of that can inspire, inspire us for uh, our own development? And um, so, of course, I'm not talking about the uh, feasibility of these measures, but just, you know, some basic ideas, some dreams uh, you, you can have uh, to share with us on the public sector and the administration. Thanks. My name is Ken Paris. I'm a Chief Economist for Communications Workers of America. Uh, in terms of the economic consensus or that 
uh, discussion. Do you foresee like a tripartite type of uh, discussion between business, unions, and government, or some kind of other uh, grouping? That's one question. Second question concerns, obviously, unemployment has, was one of the motivating factors for the entire revolution and is continuing to be a problem, especially for the undeveloped interior parts of the country. So the question is, uh, neoliberalism was, was mentioned before, the uh, current account deficit, the uh, budget deficit, the typical IMF response would be to have austerity, severe cuts in government spending, and what we've seen from many, many examples is that's led to high spikes of unemployment, not just temporary, but for quite a while. Wouldn't that lead to destabilization of the entire economy? It's not just an issue of short-term pain, it's an issue of destabilization. That's one part, and the second part is the role of the state in terms of fomenting development, not as opposed to the private sector, but in concert with, in addition to spending, targeted spending on infrastructure development, possibility of effective development banks, that type of thing. Um, the administrative sector reform is, is really a big, uh, big issue, and uh, I think there is room to, to dream on, on that one, as, as you said, and absolutely. Um, The, uh, by, the, by the way, uh, the administrative sector reform is one of the most difficult ones that have been, uh, that we know of. It's really very difficult and the experience have shown that they are very, very difficult. But I think we can do things. Uh, if, if I were to start doing something, I, I cannot give you a full template, but where I would start, uh, I will start to deal with the top tier. Uh, Tunisia has really lost its top tier. Tunisia administrative uh, administration had, was powerful and was very effective for many decades because it had a very top good tier. It used to attract top skills and uh, allow them to thrive and to develop and, and, and grow and to be responsible. This has almost completely disappeared now for many reasons. One of them is that the salary scale has been compressed so much that the top tier is really does not does not find any incentives to to perform. Uh, the private sector is much more attractive. A good new, I mean, in the 60s and the 70s, the top tier of the administration in Tunisia in the civil service was full of graduates of top universities, especially the French top schools. Now almost none. Nobody of the new top graduates goes to the to the to the public public administration now. This has to change. We have to completely reverse that, because unless you have top quality skills at the universe at, at, in the public administration, we are not going to have good relationship with the private sector, with the citizen, with the political process, and so on. The democratic system will not work. It's, it's one of the preconditions for, because, you know, that's, these are the guys who are going to implement the policies. These are the guys who are going to provide you with the, with the analysis, with the information, and so on. And so I would start with that, in reforming the way they are recruited, the way they are, um, they are, they, uh, they are paid, and the way they are, uh, their careers are, are managed in uh, this would be a first thing. Then you can start working with the rest. There is a lot to do in terms of the reforms of the uh, of, of the of the rest of the. Year. But that's that that would be my 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 first thing. It's really I just give you one um, just anecdote on the side. When I was at the central bank, I found that it was almost impossible for me as governor of central bank to to hire a high graduate to a top position in the central bank. A PhD in economics, there are no PhDs in economics at the central bank. How can you have a central bank which is self-respects itself, which wouldn't have 
I mean, I thought you should have 20 PhDs in the Central Bank of Tunisia, not zero. But the system was such that the recruitment system and the pay system and so on was such that it was almost impossible to do it. So this has to change. And I started changing some, some of that stuff. But, you know. So that's, that's one. On the consensus, the economic consensus, I'm not thinking of tripartite. I'm thinking of broader. The uh, political, uh, the national dialogue for the political process that was taking place over the last, you know, the last six, eight months was broader. There are all the social partners, the trade unions, the uh, uh, business organization and so on, but the political parties as well. So I would, I would think of it as a broader, a broader approach than tripartite. It's not enough. Tripartite is not enough. Political parties are important because they are the ones, in a democratic system, they have to be responsible. They have to be part of the decisions. Tripartite was, looks like, like old, old uh, you know, stuff. You know, it's not, uh, we have to go beyond that. Uh, very quick, uh, two comments on, on, uh, on um, austerity and the role of the state. The dilemma that we have today is that the argument that you are saying about austerity is uh, you cannot afford it because you need to face employment, unemployment, you need to create jobs, and so on. This has been the argument that has been used in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, and so on. So you can have stimulus, you can have deficits temporarily, but you cannot have forever deficit of 7% or 8% or 9%. You cannot, I mean, unless you have some miracle way of financing these deficits. So while the argument is right in principle, but when do you stop? And actually, that was the issue that we had that, that the U.S. had, you know, after the crisis. You know, when the, well, after the financial crisis 2008, 2009, the idea was to have a stimulus to kind of, to, uh, uh, to reduce the impact of the financial crisis and so on. But at, at some point, the question is, how far can you go? Can you continue? It's the same issue we have now, we are facing today. So we have this dilemma now whether, you know, given the, uh, the, the risks of getting into a spiral of indebtedness, whether you, you know, where do you stop? In this. On the role of the state, and this is related to the deficit, the role of the state, for instance, today, the deficit that we have been incurring in 2011, 2012, and 13, uh, and so on, most of this deficit has been caused by increases in current expenditures, wages and salaries and subsidies. It was not on investment. And therefore, the benefits of those expenditures in terms of employment, in terms of growth, is very, very small. So not only we have high deficits, we are unable to finance, but the composition of the expenditures have not, has not been of the good type that will you know, respond to the concerns of employment and, and so on. So, so we have these dilemmas to, to resolve. And, and by the way, the level of public expenditures on, on investment is still relatively low in Tunisia. It's relatively low. I, th I don't remember the number. I, th I think it's less than five, per it's around five percent of GDP, or, or you know, something like that. We need to go to seven or eight percent to have really an impact. Did you want to add anything? Because I think okay. Well, we're, you know, I apologize. We're not going to take more questions because I think it's getting too soon. Uh, and then, did you want to add something? Okay. So, uh, thank you to our panelists. Really appreciate your input. Thank you to all of you for attending, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have a few copies of the Tunisian constitutions here in both Arabic and in French, if you guys are interested. I wanted to thank our members of TYPE here and our partners at the Young uh, Professionals in Foreign Policy and GW for hosting us. Thank you so much and good night.